Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's MLA Productivity and Profitability webinar series. Uh, tonight, the topics that uh, we present on these webinar series are pertinent to beef, sheep, and goat producers. Tonight, we are joined by Matt Dalgleish of Mercado. He's going to be presenting um, reading the restocker market with a particular focus on beef, but he will also be touching on um, sheep there as well. Just a bit of housekeeping to start with. Uh, you should be able to hear us, um, but we cannot hear you. Um, this control panel should be up on the top right corner of your screen. Uh, at the top left-hand um, corner of that control panel, there is a red arrow that, that you can collapse and reinstate the control panel so you can get a better look at your screen. Uh, please type your questions in the box provided uh, and we'll attend to them at the end of the session. Please make them as succinct um, as possible so I can relay them to Matt at the end of the presentation and he will be able to answer any questions um, that you may have. So without further ado, I'd like to um, introduce Matt Dalgleish of Mercado. Um, Matt works with Mercado as their market analyst and wool and livestock trading manager. Prior to joining Mercado, Matt began his career in 1993 with ANZ Bank as a technical analyst for foreign currency and interest, interest rate markets. Matt progressed onto the currency trading desk both in Australia and London. In 2012, he decided to move his family to a hobby farm on the outskirts of Ballarat, where he could pursue a more rural lifestyle. Matt holds a bachelor's degree in economics and finance from RMIT and a postgraduate degree in education from Monash University. He is also the owner of a commercial piggery near Bendigo. So to present to us tonight, I introduce Matt Dougley and I will... Uh, Right, Matt. Yep, thanks for that, Hillary. Ready to go. Um, welcome everyone, and, uh, all the attendees. Um, thanks for tuning in. Um, just to, I'll just leave this slide up there just for a couple of minutes in case you want to um, jot down quickly um, any of the details if you want to catch us later or indeed follow either Mercado or myself on uh, on Twitter. We, we do tend to post there regularly, which is um, useful for some. So I'll jump in and just look at why we're here tonight. And um, at Mercado, we do um, offer every month a summary around 15 zones around Australia of how the rainfall has been um, shaping up and there was two two charts in particular that stood out for this um, current uh, offering looking at February rainfall and that was for northern New South Wales and uh, southern New South Wales. Um, if you want to see exactly what the zone covers you can jump onto Mercado and look for the rainfall um, uh, analysis we do and that can show you exactly where those zones are located. Like I said there's 15 around the country. Um, the chart you're looking at there shows where the current year's average rainfall is. So we collect rainfall data from the Bureau of Meteorology and it's um, thousands of uh, weather stations that goes into the data to give us an average rainfall for that zone. And what we can see is the increase uh, that we've seen since the start of the year, particularly in northern New South Wales and southern New South Wales. Um, just a few other bits on the chart there. So the green line is what the, flow was, uh, the rainfall was like on average each month last season. The black dotted line is the 50 year trend. So it's kind of what you could consider to be a normal seasonal movement uh, for that zone. The gray area is is, um, is kind of the, what you expect in, in, in any given year as a standard. It's one, one standard deviation away from that average, the uh, dotted line, the average. Uh, and then the red, uh, the red dotted lines are two standard deviations away. So once we're getting outside above or below that red dotted line is what you'd probably call um, out of, out of, um, out of, very much out of the normal, uh, or at the extreme levels, uh, beyond two standard deviations for those that are statistically minded. So obviously, we can see northern New South Wales very, very high rainfall for Feb, and um, and for southern New South Wales just heading into that extreme territory now. 
that's part of the reason why we're here now looking at this restocker market. Um, as Hillary suggested, uh, I am going to cover off on, on uh, sheep uh, initially. So we'll start with them, uh, not to uh, you know, forget our, our uh, red meat cousins there. For those people that have tuned in on beef, um, that'll be next. So the first thing I would want to show you just regards to the sheep market and restocker activity is something we look at on Mercado. And it's, um, we call it the um, sheep offtake uh, the sheep offtake rate ratio. Um, and what it is, we're looking at sheep turnoff and live exports as a proportion or a percentage of the flock. Uh, and it's a rolling 12 month average. So the orange line is that sheep offtake. And what we know is that um, the sheep offtake gives us an indication as to whether we're rebuilding the flock or um, going through a destocking phase. And the crucial level to focus in on is, is the 12% threshold for the sheep offtake ratio. So you can see um, the green line on the chart shows the flock within Australia. And you can see those gray shaded areas are the times when, you know, going back to 1982, they're the times when the sheep offtake ratio was below 12%. And so you can see in those gray shaded areas, quite often is where we see the um, flock increasing. So below 12% in rebuild mode, and we start to see the flock going up. And the last time we saw that um, for a short period of time was the, the most recent, decent uh, season we had through that 16, 17 period um, where we saw it dip down to just above 9% at its lowest, the sheep offtake ratio, and we did start to see the flock rebuild. So obviously the dry spell we have been seeing up until recently had pushed that sheep offtake ratio up towards 15% at the peak. Um, it is a bit of a lagged indicator, um, so we, we look. It's not quite up to date as of the February range, but certainly up to date as of January. And we can see that the trend has turned and it is starting to head down. We're not yet underneath the 12% threshold, so technically we would be saying at Mercado we're not yet in the rebuilding phase of the flock. But certainly with the range we've been seeing over February, um, particularly in New South Wales. Um, we're expecting this sheep offtake ratio to continue to trend lower and, and go under 12% uh, during this year. Um, and certainly if we start to see uh, in the south what looks to be a good uh, autumn break, um, that's going to continue to to put pressure on that sheep offtake ratio and, and move to uh, a stage where we are definitely, uh, technically speaking, in a rebuild phase for the sheep flock. Now back in Late January on Mercado, we did put a piece up just looking at some um, trading scenarios uh, for those who were interested in, and were starting to have pasture available. So we have got also within this um, simple margin tool uh, an allowance for feed, cost of feed, in case um, there wasn't much pasture available. But it does give you an idea um, if, you, if you're buying lambs and at the price at the time when we looked at this, um, this particular piece was, was $9 for your 35 um, kilo lamb and then carrying them through to a 50 kilo weight. Um, and we, what we put on the uh, estimation here that the trading budget was a, a, a low price range, an expected price range and a strong price range. And if you focus in on that final column, the strong price range with a, with a sale price uh, at $9 a kilo carcass weight and allowing for a cost of feed of $40 um, for, for the period of the, of the trading um, uh, episode. You can see that that's it's reasonable um, good margin at twenty dollars or nearly twenty one dollars a head uh, per lamb, and that's based off a nine dollar um, sale price. Um, currently, your trade lamb sitting as of the close of today, I think it was nine sixty. So it's even above that now. And if you're in a situation where you have got grass available and you're not requiring the cost of feed, you can see very quickly that those margins become quite healthy indeed. So what this meant for Particularly, um, we're looking initially now at national restocker indicator compared to the uh, eastern states trade lamb indicator. We can see that, that through um, the start of the year here, we have moved um, with the restocker to a premium, whereas back in that dry spell uh, in mid-2019, the restocker lambs uh, fell to a significant discount because of the, um, the lack of interest there. And if we shift to, if you remember back to that rainfall we just saw in New South Wales, if you look at the New South Wales restocker indicator against the Eastern States trade lamb indicator, we can see that that premium is even more pronounced. Um, certainly in the last um, month, it's, it's really extended. So that does tell us that within the uh, sheep market, uh, or the lamb market, I should say, um, restockers have become very interested. And we can take a further look at, at that New, New South Wales restocker market 
and just look at the actual spread uh, and the spread through time. And we can see now just recently that the spread has actually got, to look at those arrows there, back to levels that we saw um, through that 2016-17 um, season when uh, that, that last time we had that decent amount of rainfall and we saw that sheep off take ratio dip below 12%. We're back at levels now in terms of premium for New, New South Wales restocker lambs, uh, what we saw back then. So that's another indication to say to us that, that those restockers are definitely back in the market in that space. Just to finish off on that lamb market now, um, we just want to show you what the forecast model is for Mercado uh, looking at the Eastern States Trail Lamb Indicator. So what we've got is the um, the annual average price in orange and what the model, the Mercado model forecasts as the annual average price for this season and the next two seasons going out. And the grey zone is what we expect as a normal kind of range that the model or that you'd see through the season. So what it's saying for this year as an annual average price for the whole year, we're looking at a 65 cents a kilo carcass weight for the ESCLI. And if you overlay what you'd consider to be the normal uh, seasonal movement, so that the normal peak and trough on any given season, that grey line, what an 865 annual average price says is we're looking at it around a 690 uh, cents per kilo trough during the year and a potential winter peak uh, of around the 1040 level uh, for the Eastern States Trade Lane Indicator. So um, obviously we've already seen some significant run up in the Eastern States Trade Lane Indicator so far um, very early in the season, um, but we're anticipating as it gets tighter into winter, um, for that indicator to, to breach above $10 um, through that normal really tight um, scenario in winter. And that bodes well for those that are still looking at potential uh, trend land trading margin, bearing in mind when we went back to that original margin analysis, we're looking at a $9 buy price and a $9 sell price, so fairly healthy healthy margins um, at a $9.60 um, or thereabouts price or even potentially a fraction higher. There's, there's potentially still some money in there if you're looking at um, the Eastern States trade lane indicator is still, still probing higher this season. And the other thing to take away, I guess, before I move on to cattle is the outlook for um, uh, land prices uh, for the next few years, given where our supply is currently sitting uh, and, and the growing export interest uh, that we've been seeing over the last well, at least decade uh, for, for sheep beef, not just lamb, but mutton. Um, the, the prices for the next few years are also um, forecast on an annual average basis to remain above um, 800 cents a kilo carcass weight. So moving now to uh, cattle markets and we'll start off looking at a, a similar concept to our sheep offtake ratio, it's something we look at on Mercado uh, we call the female slaughter ratio and it's uh, simply a percentage um, calculation of the number of female cattle slaughtered um, as a proportion or as a percentage of total slaughter. And so what it does is it gives us an indication again as to whether the cattle market is in a destocking phase or in a, in a um, rebuild phase. So if we just cast our mind back quickly to last season, the annual average uh, female slaughter ratio for the year was 56%, and that's the highest uh, we've ever seen. And the graphic just shows you there, you know, that proportion uh, just in visual terms of that 56% um, slaughter rate. Just like um, the sheep offtake ratio is a 12% threshold for whether you're in rebuild or destocking. The sustainable or the, or the, the, the threshold for the cattle market is 47%. Um, and that's, that's the sh that at 47%, you've pretty much got the herd just going sideways, not, not growing nor declining. Uh, realistically, to get back to a, a stage where we're seeing significant growth in, um, in the cattle herd, we've really got to be looking at a female slaughter ratio of down into the low 40, 40 areas, so 43% is what you'd consider to be a fairly decent level to be rebuilding. And uh, just looking at what that's meant for the last few years in terms of the herd, so we had um, restocking going through that 16, 17 as it was getting, turning from the dry 14, 15 into um, that wetter season, we started to see that herd building up. Um, and if you, if you contrast, um, just before I go further, if you contrast back to that 14, 15, period when we were heavily destocking uh, the herd due, due to the drought then. The female slaughter ratio for 2014 was something like 51% or you know, bordering on 52% as an annual average. It just goes to show that that 2019 season at a female slaughter ratio of 56% was incredibly high and, and like I said, certainly the highest uh, that we'd ever seen. 
uh, going back for as long as the records uh, go. Um, so what we saw through that 16, 17, as the season turned away from the drought in 14, 15, um, the female slaughter ratio was below 47% and we had a rebuild of the herd such that by the end of 2018, we we're sitting at around 28 million head of cattle. But then it started to turn dry and that 2019 season with a female slaughter ratio of 56%, um, we saw a significant decline in the, in the cattle herd um, for the 2019 period. And the MLA forecast for the current season uh, that were released in February from their cattle market uh, outlook is um, projecting a, a herd of 24.7 million head um, this season. Uh, and that's the lowest herd we've seen in Australia in over 30 years. Um, so very tight supply, and, and that's obviously part of the reason too that's, um, that's underpinning some of these very strong prices we've been seeing at the moment. Obviously, um, the rain as well, helping the, along the way there. If we just want to look at that female slaughter ratio in a more graphic format, um, we can see, again, another one of those seasonal charts we put up on Mercado that shows the, the, the dotted grey line is the, uh, the average, the 10-year average trend. And the grey area is what you'd expect as, as a normal movement through a given season. And you've just put on the 2018 and also the 2014 season where we can see um, those were times where we, you know, we moved through early 2018 from a wetter to dry period. So through the middle of the year when we got to here, we started to destock and continued to destock all the way through the end of 2018. But you can see also similar type levels, uh, certainly what we saw in 2014, that last destocking phase. And then came along 2019, and it just, you know, particularly through this early part of um, into autumn of that year, it was such a dry um, autumn and winter, and particularly in New South Wales and Queensland, that the, uh, the, the female slaughter ratio went to extraordinary high levels, uh, and obviously uh, maintained them through the rest of the year, so that we ended up with a with an average for the year of 56%. If we just see where we are now, as of the start of this season. Um, January figures were just released yesterday, so there is a bit of a lag uh, with these um, female slaughter ratio figures. Uh, the ABS are about a month and a half behind, so we do have to wait and see. But the start of the season um, came in at 52.7% as an average for the month, which was higher than the average for January last year and well higher than what the January was back in 2014. Um, with the... Uh, restocker activity we've seen now in February, we do expect in Mercado that we will see that female slaughter ratio um, start to dip uh, as the numbers are released for February, but we do have to wait until early April before we can really see what's happening. But we are expecting um, that to come off now and, and, conti and continue to, to decline and move towards um, a, a herd rebuild phase if we continue to get some good rainfall through, through the latter part of autumn and into winter. So just turning to uh, prices now and, and what we've seen with regards to the, the movement of prices, both for uh, the Eastern Young Cattle Indicator and something we look at uh, very closely here at Mercado is the 90CL, which is the um, grinding uh, ma manufactured beef price that, that goes into North America from Australia and, and also New Zealand. So that um, 90CL stands for 90CL chemical lean, so it's chemical lean, so it's a, a very lean uh, trim uh, ground beef. Uh, that goes in and, and, and forms the uh, the famous uh, US um, burger patty. Um, for those that have an interest in burger patties, they, they try and average for about a 73% CL. Um, so they're using some of that very lean Australian New Zealand product and combining that with a fattier uh, version of the ground meat to create that 73 CL patty. So it's, a, it's an important indicator uh, uh, as a long-term indicator for Australia, given the amount of um, uh, both product, the Australian product that goes to the US um, but also, from an international perspective, the US are a very, um, uh, well, they're, they're probably our most um, uh, direct competitor in, in the markets into Japan and South Korea. Um, so they're a big, one of our bigger clients and, and a very um, big competitor into, our, into our, some of our key markets there. And that, for that reason, uh, quite often the um, prices within Australia over the long term for cattle uh, tends to track uh, what's happening with regards to that um, 90 cell. And so certainly we do look at the 90 cell compared to the ECI and we can see there are times where they go out of sync and that can usually be due to um, either very dry conditions within Australia or very wet conditions. Um, and, and if I go back to that 14, 15 period, we did see for quite a period there where the 
uh, Ethi was at a, a far lower level and the premium opened up um, to the 90 CL through that time. The US were coming out of a uh, destocking phase and they were just coming also out off the GFC uh, issues. So the economy was improving there. Demand for beef was picking up. Um, there wasn't as much product available, so there was a very voracious appetite for beef product out of the US during that 14-15 period. Australian prices were quite cheap. Um, and so during that time, in fact, the US became our biggest beef market for about a year and a half. Such was the volumes going from Australia to the US. However, when it started to rain uh, within Australia, we saw that restocker activity increase and we went from a destocking phase to a rebuild through 16, 17, and that's when the ECI reached its previous peak uh, through August of uh, 2016 at 7.25 Um And you can see during that time, um, the the um, ECI went to a premium to the 9SL. Obviously, the more recent period here through 2018-19, uh, again, moving back to a drought scenario, uh, we saw uh, the ECI fall away and go back to a discount. Um, this big run-up we saw late in 2019 uh, in the 9SL, a lot of that big run-up was the, the remnants of um, African swine fever impacting China. Um, the appetite out of China for, for all protein products uh, during that time was such that the US was starting to have to scramble uh, for some of that um, meat product, that manufactured meat product. And so there was a, a spike in that in that 90 CL and the, uh, the, the premium went to um, significantly wide levels. In fact, levels uh, wider than we saw um, through 14, 15. And then the subsequent uh, sell-off we've seen just in, in more recent times has been on the back of uh, concerns around the coronavirus and, and the, the falling demand um, from China through that period when the, there was a shutdown in, in January and February. And so just in the last week, we have, with the rain we've been seeing and the rally in the ECI, um, we've seen the ECI move to a premium now uh, to the 90 CL. And for those that saw the Mercado uh, presentation that I did uh, for Homes and Sackett, I think it was late last year. There's a chart that I've just put up now that, that um, we're looking at this relationship between the, the ECI and the non ECL, the spread, and how um, what happens within uh, Australia in terms of cattle slaughter, how there is actually a relationship between that spread and our annual cattle slaughter levels. And that chart I put up last time around, and, and I'll just highlight in on the 2020 period where I spoke about saying that we were expecting. Uh, to see the ECI move to a premium to the 90 CL based on the normal relationship that we, we tend to find uh, between these two price series. And the fact that we're ex going to experience quite low slaughter this year, uh, given the, the small herd size, we were looking at an average um, premium over the season of around 50 cents uh, of the ECI above the 90 CL. Um, the last time we saw similar premiums was in fact back in 2016 through that last period of that, uh, restocker activity of a spread of a, uh, annual average spread of around 50 cents. Um, now the interesting thing to, to, to realise back then in 2016, even though the annual average was a uh, 50 cent premium, during the year um, it actually the spread actually opened up at one stage to about $1.70 and that was when the uh, restocker activity pushed the ECI to that peak. And we had um, the ECI at 7.25 and the 90 CL at about 5.55. And that was the widest it went through that time. Um, certainly, if you contrast that to currently, we're nowhere near that level um, just yet. So as we move into winter, um, potentially there is um, the possibility we could see that ECI spread uh, premium open up to over you know, 150 cents. Um, and then based off a current 90 CL of 6.85, we're, we're looking then at an ECI um, up over eight, eight, uh, $8. Uh, and certainly um, some of our Mercado forecasting, uh, as I'm going to show you shortly, will show that the model's also saying we could see levels of that um, magnitude this season. So just um, having just one little look uh, at the, um, the ECI and the behaviour we've seen just this, this year, um, the January run-up in prices um, in the ECI was actually more feedlot driven. If you look at the behaviour of the different buyer groups at the sale yard, we know that um, in January for the average, um, feedlots are actually paying more uh, for ECI style cattle than what um, restockers were paying. In fact, for, for January, feedlots were paying an average of 5.88 cents across the eastern seaboard um, sale yards. Whereas uh, restockers were paying an average of 5.68 cents, so 20 cents less than what feedlot feedlot buyers were paying, and compared to processors in January, were paying 
another um, 20 cents softer at 5.48 cents. So we know that that January uh, initial uh, improvement in the ECI was was mostly driven um, by the feedlots um, paying the higher prices. If you um, contrast um, that to the February now, um, restockers have well and truly taken over um, paying their higher premium. So the February average uh, for restockers is at 7.50 cents. Uh, and that's similar levels to what we saw during the um, peak in the ECI back here in, uh, in 2016. Um, restockers are paying also around those similar levels, 7.50 cents on average across those recent state sale yards. Um, and if you look at rest, uh, feedlots, also currently they're paying around, or they, yeah, we're around that seven, um, uh, seven ten cent level, uh, and that was similar to what they were paying uh, now as well. Um, so, so if you contrast in the last time around, we saw uh, a historic peak in the ECI back in August, uh, and then subsequently in October as well, it nearly got to uh, it's got to seven twenty three, so two cents short of the peak. Um, both restockers and feedlots are paying roughly similar levels um, than what they were paying back then. The contrast is, um, is the uh, processes uh, back in 2016 processes were paying on average, um, at those peaks they were paying on average 6.90 cents, whereas at the moment they're only um, averaging, through January they're only averaging, uh, sorry February, they're only averaging 6.40 cents, so 50 cents less than what they were paying um, back in, in the previous peak. So that yeah, the appetite for processes at the moment is is quite um, diminished, and and given what's happening in uh, global beef markets, that's probably unsurprising. And also given um, what's forecast in terms of the tight season we're going to experience this year uh, for cattle markets, um, I think the processes are, are trying to um, hold on to as much corn as possible because it's it's potentially going to get very uh, tough for them this season. If we just look at a bit of a breakdown of that three stocker spread and looking at that spread. Um, to the ECI, we can see that um, we're not quite at levels that we saw uh, back through that um, those peaks in 16, 17, uh, but we're nearly there uh, in terms of the in terms of the restocker spread. And part of the reason why we're not quite there yet is because um, within that restocker market, if we break it down further, we're looking at the seasonal trend here now of, of restockers. So across the whole of the eastern seaboard, uh, in terms of a percentage movement. Of, of spread, we're back at the levels we saw back in 2016 at this time of the year in March at around, um, or it was was around 7% last week and it's dipped to closer to um, just over 5% this week. Uh, but similar levels than what we saw last last year. But we can actually break down further this ECI restocker analysis and, and look at the difference between northern and southern restockers. Um, and at Mercado, when we refer to northern and southern, we've, we've arbitrarily picked Dubbo sale yard as the as the dividing line between northern and southern. So, interesting if you look at northern restocker behaviour, so so restocker buyers that are operating at sale yards in Dubbo and to the north into southern Queensland, uh, they're actually paying um, quite higher premiums for Eki style cattle. And again, uh, similar to what we saw uh, before it started to turn dry back in 2018. Uh, and at levels you'd consider to be on the top end of what's normal in terms of the range uh, for this time of the season. Uh, if you contrast that to southern restockers, uh, southern restockers are only paying about a 1% premium at the moment. So they haven't really fully engaged to the same tune as their northern counterparts. And, and I think that could be um, partially due to um, some of those southern restockers um, wanting to just get a bit more confirmation that it is going to be a uh, good southern autumn break. And uh, that could be the next catalyst for a, uh, a potential move higher in the Eki as we head into more into the depths of autumn and into winter. So just turning to our uh, Eastern Young Cattle Indicator annual forecast, um, and again similar to what I showed you with the uh, ESTLI, um, the orange line is the annual average Eki, and the green line is what the model predicts, and the grey shaded zone is what we could consider to be. Um, a, a, a normal range within the season of the trough and the peak. So in, in short term there, the model's predicting an annual average ECI of 6.40 cents for 2020. And that would, uh, it, it levels like that, um, we, then that's, can, that's taking into account some of the rain we've seen now, but it isn't taking into account if we continue to get uh, a much wetter autumn and winter. If we do get a much uh, wetter autumn and winter, you could see that um, 640 cent annual average price move up to around a 690 cent level 
as, a, as an annual average ECI for the 2020 season. Um, and at those levels, um, you're talking about a, a potential trough in the ECI through the season, through 2020 at 550 cents, and a potential peak in the ECI um, even as high as 865 cents. Um, and you know that, and so that's what we could be facing as we head further into winter. Um, I, I would not be surprised to see an Eki up into the 828, 38, 40 level at all, and potentially, like I said, up above uh, 850, 865 as a as a stretch target. Um, for those that are interested, that this particular model takes into account the Aussie dollar level. Um, there's also what well, we look at a supply ratio between the US and Australia in terms of production. Um, global cattle prices as annual average prices that come from USDA and, um, and live cattle futures markets. Uh, there's also a climate factor involved in it that takes into account um, rainfall or drier or wetter conditions and also um, feed costs. Um, so it's a fairly robust model um, and gives us a picture um, as to what we could expect this season. Um, we've got a similar model that we run at Mercado for national heavy steer uh, as an annual average forecast. Um, Similar inputs to this model, but slightly different. Um, the national heavy steer is not as climate responsive um, according to the model as what the ECI is, and that's probably understandable given um, given the young cattle and uh, that interest to the background um, is such, a, and the restock activity could be such an important driver of the younger cattle market, but far less um, an important driver of the national heavy steer market. Obviously, um, restockers aren't keen to buy 600 kilo beef. Um, but the model input for the national heavy steer is again the Australian dollar. Um, there's a slaughter to herd ratio, um, the size of the herd, global cattle price again, and a feed price uh, that goes into that model. So it's not um, as climate responsive. However, um, with the very tight supply and the slaughter forecast that we are seeing from MLA this season, um, that is supporting uh, stronger finished cattle prices for 2020. And the annual average we've got uh, is around the 6.25 cent um, level as, as an annual average price, or um, uh, and um, a potential range for, for heavy steers of 4.75 as a trough, and even as high as potentially 700, uh, 700 cents uh, as we go through the very depths of, uh, of winter. So. Coming to the crux of it, we, we produced on Mercado about a fortnight or so ago now. This um, It was a, an article looking at um, paying high prices for young cattle and what, what becomes too high a price. So we, we decided on creating a simple matrix that looks at a grass-fed um, cattle trade. Uh, and um, in terms of the actual trade, we're looking at um, buying a 350 kilo uh, young cattle, uh, accounting for around $200 in, in costs uh, per animal, so that, that I think is a fairly, um, fairly reasonable estimate for transport and vet costs and other, other associated costs that you might find um, during the time your background in this animal. And looking at a, a sale weight of 550 kilos, we've, um, we've looked at a few scenarios in terms of the buy price down the, down the, the brown column there in live weight pricing and the sell column, and then the matrix uh, determines what the dollar per head profit or loss is based off uh, a trade such as this as a, as a simple grass fed trade. And we can see that um, if you just focus in on those two last columns with um, with the sale price of, of your heavy cattle around that 325 to 350 live weight price, uh, the 325 translates roughly to a $6 um, carcass weight price and the 350 uh, translates roughly to a $650 um, dollar carcass weight price. And if you recall, with that heavy steer annual average forecast around that 625 level, we're, we're right in the middle of that potentially as an annual average price for this season. And, and for next season, um, the forecast actually is equally as good for the, um, for the national heavy steer with prices above that $6 level again, uh, following through into next season also. Um, so if you're looking at a, a yearly trade, um, you can quickly see that still buying at say um, 4.30 cents or 4.40 cents, um, for the younger cattle uh, entry prices, you're still getting margins of um, of $220 or $185 per head after you've taken into account a, $20, a $200 per head um, cost. Uh, now, um, for those that can't do the math that quickly, that means that at $0.430 cent purchase price, that equates to a uh, carcass weight price of uh, $7.95. Um, a $4.40 purchase price equates to a 
to a carcass weight price of 8.15 cents approximately and a 4.50 purchase price equates to a carcass weight price of 8.35. Um, so assuming that finished cattle market can hold up and certainly the models are suggesting that it will hold up um, this season and into next season at around that 3.25 to 3.50, there's no reason why under this simple grass fed um, trade you could not be you could be buying um, young cattle over eight dollars uh, up to you know eight thirty or so and potentially still making you know one hundred and fifty dollars one hundred and eighty five dollars uh, profit ahead on that trade. Uh, I'll just finish now with a uh, a final request that we had from a subscriber. It was actually that was a Holmes and Sackett um, uh, um, customer that, that sent through a message to Hillary just wanting to um, get a feel for where the long-term um, pricing is for, for young cattle. And I know that the, um, the Eastern Young Cattle Indicator doesn't go back as far as 1953, but at Mercado, we did have the data uh, on, on young cattle prices across the East Coast to create a, a proxy indicator for what it would have been should had there been an ECI back in those years. Uh, and what we've done with this particular chart is we have, um, using um, CPI levels for each quarter, we've been able to replicate what would be the current day dollar value uh, back in those days, uh, you know, back going back to 1953. And so the chart shows um, that that current day dollar value, and we can see now where the where the ECI just uh, finished the other day at 762 cents a kilo carcass weight. Um, the long term average trend of the ECI is around the 530 cent level, which is that dotted dotted dark dotted line. Again, the grey area would be your what you consider, I guess, a normal range. So you're talking something like um, 380 cents to 7. 100 cents as a normal range you could expect in current day dollars. So we're just, you know, 65 or 62 odd cents above what's considered the normal range now in current day dollar terms. The interesting thing to take away from it though is that orange line is what you'd consider to be the extreme levels that you, you know, we call it the 95% range. So you're basically saying 95% of the time prices would be within that banding. But we can see very quickly that in the past on current day dollar terms, we have had four times uh, going back uh, through the kind of late 50s, early 60s, through to um, almost the 1980s, where we had young cattle prices up in that 850 and indeed even above $9 uh, in terms of a cent per kilo carcass weight. So it's not unheard of that we could see um, the ECI uh, touch up towards that you know 850 level this season. Um, the big caveat on that, of course, is... Um, what happens with the, I know it's been, I don't want to labour the point on coronavirus because it's all over the news, but it certainly has um, had an impact to um, global beef prices. The, the uh, US live cattle uh, price is, is, is pretty much crashed on the back of um, concerns around corona. There's no, I don't think there's any real fundamental drivers that are causing um, that crash. And certainly um, from an Australian export perspective, um, if we look at the beef export data, that came out for February, um, Australian exports of beef to the to China, even despite the coronavirus, um, were still for February was still 46% higher than the five-year trend for February. So um, the coronavirus did have an impact um, on our beef exports. They were about 20% softer from January to February, but the January numbers were very very high. Um, so we have seen somewhat of a softening, but it's not panic stations just yet for our beef exports. Um, the sell-off we've seen in global prices, um, both in the 90CL and the live US live futures price, has been largely speculative based around concerns of the coronavirus certainly becoming pandemic and impacting global growth to a significant manner, so that it's such that it wipes off you know, half a percent or a percent of global growth and, and potentially moves into the stage where we see a, a GFC-style uh, economic crash that could impact global prices. Um, that certainly is a bit of a concern. Um, however, on the on the positive side for the Australian situation, we've got to remember that we are in a very very tight supply situation this year with regards to our cattle herd. Uh, that's going to provide some level of insulation to livestock prices at the sale yard, despite what happens to a degree with the meat price. Um, and obviously, this rain, if this continues through into um, autumn and into winter that we're seeing now, we get a really good season. That restocker activity certainly for the younger uh, cattle is going to continue to support um, 
prices for, for those types of stock and for indeed breeding cattle as well, uh, heifers and PTIC uh, cow. Um, I think that pretty much takes me to the end. I'm not sure how I've gone for time. I think, uh, no, it's not too bad, I think. Um, we've got time for questions and um, just if you, just I'll finish on, um, on mentioning for those that don't know, uh, the team at Mercado do run a regular commodity conversation, a podcast, so you can get that on all your normal uh, podcast uh, subscription channels. Just search for commodity conversations. We put out a, um, a very short 10 minute summary of cattle and sheep and wool and grain markets, um, easy to listen to. Uh, and then we also put out um, occasionally every, every fortnight or three weeks or so, um, maybe one month if we're really busy, uh, we put out a long form uh, a topic where we discuss something more in depth um, and, and, and we would discuss things like the US trade uh, issue with China was one of the last ones we put out. And we often, with the long form one, it goes for somewhere between half an hour to 40 minutes, we will often get in a, a guest speaker, um, people, you know, such people like Fiona Simpson and others that are that we find um, can come to talk to us about some interesting developments that are happening in agricultural markets. Um, so there's all my details. I'm going to grab a quick drink of water while um, Hillary starts to shoot me a few questions. I think. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. And I, uh, I think we just broke our record for a number of attendees into a webinar. So a very hot topic and well presented. Thank you for that information. Just to give Matt a bit of a break, if you do have to leave early, please take the time to uh, do the webinar survey that will pop up on your screen when you exit out of the webinar. This survey um, goes back to MLA, uh, Home Sacket, the facilitators, and to the presenters like Matt, who um, just to make sure that we're um, hitting the targets on, on what you guys are wanting to hear and um, by the number of people that um, logged on tonight, I think we've got the topics right, that's for sure. So, um, and just on that next week, we have Ben Lin from the McKinnon Project, who's going to be talking to us about feeding uh, weaner cattle, whether you should be production feeding or maintenance feeding and the different rations and costs associated with those. Uh, we've got a few questions coming through, so if you're right, Matt, we'll jump into those. Yep, when you're ready, Hilary. Okay, so the first one from Fiona. Um, I assume the high female slaughter ratio includes massive culling in the dairy industry. Is this exaggerating the figures for beef cows? Uh, it, it does. Um, and that's potentially part of what we saw through that 2019 season, although um, in terms of uh, percentage numbers, um, you probably you know, like this. You know, if you look, if you contrast that 2014-15 uh, female slaughter ratios to what we saw through 2019, not all of that increase is accounted for by the the change to the dairy sector. You might be you might be lucky to say it's maybe one percentage point, or perhaps one and a half percentage points. But there was some significant uh, movement in the broader cattle market uh, and particularly through um, New South Wales. And that's quite obvious. If you, if you look at um, those rainfall charts I showed you at the very start of the presentation, if you go back and look at the rainfall charts we were seeing for Western New South Wales in particular and, um, and Southern Northern New South Wales through that whole um, 2019 period, we were talking about very, very extremely dry conditions. And I think anyone that saw the footage and, and is in those areas, I'm, I don't have to you know, labour the point because they've had a real tough time. So I think it wasn't just the, um, the downturn in the dairy sector that was fueling that high female slaughter ratio. It was indeed um, significant destocking that was happening across the country. Thanks for the question. Yeah. Uh, question from Mark. Does the female slaughter ratio uh, percentage only measure New South Wales and Queensland? So is it biased towards what's happening in Northern Australia? Uh, no, it doesn't. It's, um, it's data that comes from the ABS and it takes into account um, not just the eastern seaboard, um, it's the, across the whole of the country. So it includes WA. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's ABS-based data um, and it's a national figure. You can get a breakdown. Um, sometimes on Mercado we will put up um, articles on the female slaughter ratio and, and as to be expected, um, those um, when you think back to that 47% threshold, that's the national threshold in terms of destocking and restocking. Um, but if you break it down into the different states, you do find um, that um, the female slaughter ratio 
is lower as you head further north, and that's part part of the reason is obviously more pastoral uh, production there and and um, branding rates. Are, you know, it's a trickier operation when you're getting out to those northern pastoral regions in terms of the breeding operation compared to the south, which is a little bit more um, easier to manage. Uh, obviously, in terms of contact point and in terms of climate. Uh, so um, different different areas of the country have um, relatively different um, uh, ratios uh, based on, on what the production system that, that works for that part of the country. Um, but what we look at at Mercado mostly is that is that national figure, and, and that's what I've quoted here is all the national female slaughter ratio figures. Great, thanks. Matt. Uh, next one from Darren. Can you please explain what the restocker spread means? Uh, yep, no, it's a good question. Um, so what it is is we're um, sale yard data across those. Um, so there's, I think it's 28 sale yards across the eastern uh, seaboard that that combines in to create the Eki. Um, and with um, with that data, we can identify who the buyers are of those particular Eki cattle, um, whether they're restockers, whether they're feedlots, whether they're processors. And so what we do is we're fi we're filtering that data to um, look and see what the average price just those buying groups have, have paid for. Um, and so when I was mentioning those numbers of, you know, 750 for February for restockers compared to 710 for feedlot, that's basically saying that across the average um, of all those um, eastern states sale yards for that particular week, um, restockers for buyers are averaging 750 cents, whereas feedlots were averaging 710 cents, right? Now the, the the spread is when we compare that price of the of the restocker average prices to what the Eki actually was for that um, for that week. So say the 750 was the the restocker uh, average, but the Eki was at 730 cents across the whole of the you know that's just what the Eki was. That spread is then comparing the the percentage spread. So that 20 cent spread of 750 to 730 is is what those restockers are paying as a premium uh, compared to other buying groups. Um, so as it stands now, you've got the the, the um, you know uh, restock is paying certainly in the north they're paying that seven percent premium. The southern restock is paying a one percent premium, so not as aggressively seeking those Eki style cattle, or, or maybe not as optimistic just yet. Um, and so what you can start to do when you filter out that data is to understand what the different buying groups are doing. And so it's really a spread back to the Eki itself, um, and it gives us a real clue as to, like I said, what. Uh, what the intentions are, what the optimism is looking like for that particular market uh, or that particular buying group within the market. I hope that answered that one. Great. Yep. Let us know if you need some further explanation, Darren. Uh, next question from John. Could you please convert uh, an EQ of six to eight in plain English? That is, what is your projection for a feeder type steer in dollars per kilogram live weight? Um, so you break up a bit there. Now, what we were saying was the Eki forecast was that they wanted me to convert that to a yeah dollar per kilo dollar. live weight, please, Matt. Uh, yeah. So what I'm using for the for the yield on that is a, a 54% yield when you're going from uh, live weight to carcass weight. So um, I think the query was it was that an 865 price was it they're after um, as the as a conversion? Eki of six to eight. Is that what you? I'll just I'll say the question again. Can you please yep. convert an Eki of six to eight in plain English? That is, what is your projection oh, for oh, a so feeder? Is that six to eight as in the price of six to eight? Uh, it just has six dash eight. Not quite sure. Maybe the meaning is oh, okay. Maybe a six dollar price to an eight dollar price. What the conversion is? Ah, uh, yeah, um, Yeah. Okay. So, so basically, what you're doing is, is for the six dollar price, I'm, I'll be multiplying it by 0.54, which is the yield. So that gives you a 3.25. At a six dollar, it's a 3.24 actually, um, live weight price. And at eight dollars, again multiplied by 0.54, which is your 54 percent yield, is a 4.32 live weight price. Okay, great. So 3.24 and 4.32. Okay, great. Let us know, John, if you want some um, further clarification. Merrick um, uh, wants to know, what is the time frame estimated for the grass-fed um, trade matrix? Yep, so we looked off a, a, basically a year, and we're going off, I think it was something like a 0.7 um, 
kilogram weight gain from memory. It was um, it was 350 to 550, uh, which is 200 kilos over your 365. Uh, Oh no, sorry, not point seven, point five four, uh, point so just a bit point five, yeah. I think the point the point seven point eight would be getting maybe closer to if you're using some feed um additive there, I think. Great. Thank you. Oh, there's so many questions coming now. Um Oh, interesting question from Nick. If there is a GFC style event, what would you expect the um I assume that means AUD to do. I assume that means Australian dollar and what? <laughs> yeah, it does, yeah. Yeah. Um, so we've already seen, um, so I'm assuming they're, they're meaning with this coronavirus um, blowing out and it, it's certainly looking like, well, the, the World Health Organization has declared now a pandemic as of overnight, I believe. So, so the, we woke up to the news today that they are saying it is a pandemic. Um, it's certainly shaping up to be significant um, globally, how much, it, I think there's still some conjecture around how much it's gonna shave off GDP. So it may be a significant event, but it may not be as significant as the GSC. I, I don't uh, expect it to be, but then I'm not a, I'm not a World Bank economist. Um, uh, so, so I'd have to take, you know, uh, probably smarter people than me at, uh, at, at the very echelons of, uh, of the World Bank and IMF would be probably um, trying to figure out exactly what it's going to um, do to global growth in terms of GDP um, uh, per annum. Um, however, if we, did, if we did see something like a GFC event, um, that the, the Australian dollar is a, is a risk-based um, currency. So when there are riskier scenarios happening um, it does get sold off because it's um, it's not it, and, and because we're heavily commodity weighted as a as a country in terms of our exports. Um, when there's problems with global growth, um, they sell the Aussie generally as a as a financial community. Um, and and certainly uh, we have seen that already. Um, if you recall back to before the coronavirus um, broke out of China, uh, just in uh, early uh, late December, early January, the Aussie was testing up towards seventy cents. And, um, and since the coronavirus broke, and as it's become more and more obvious that it's um, it's becoming a big issue, we've seen the Aussie um, go down to I think the low just the other night was 63.20, um, and and in that particular low it dropped about three and a half cents or three cents, two and a half cents or something uh, in a, in a short space of time, which is the type of um, panic selling you start to see when um, when the currency markets are, are very focused on um, these kind of risk concerns. Um, I think some of the movement in the Aussie dollar now has already started to factor in um, problems with COVID-19 impacting the global economy. Um, it's hard to tell exactly how much um, of the sell-off in the Aussie has been already factored in. Um, sometimes with currency markets, you don't find out until uh, you know after the movement's happened and then you get to explain what's happening later. Um, so, so you know, is there more um, pain for the Aussie uh, potentially? Um, I. I would expect um, when we're heading down towards six, the 60 cent level, I'd, I'd be surprised to see it go below that. Um, and even if it entered into real GFC type territory, um, if you do recall back to the GFC, the initial reaction uh, from currency markets was to sell the Aussie down to those levels. But then when it was, um, when it was realised that the Australian economy was actually one of the few economies in, in the Western world that was able to weather the storm of the GFC, if you recall, our growth continued to go very well and our interest rates stayed reasonably high compared to the rest of the world um, and our and our government debt levels um, didn't blow out like it did in parts of Europe. Um, once the financial community realised the strength of the Australian economy, uh, the core strength of the Australian economy, um, we saw the Aussie recover very quickly and indeed uh, post the GFC uh, when we went through to 2011 was when we saw the Aussie dollar Go to a dollar ten against the US, so over over parity, which is um, you know the highest it's been in since probably the float back in uh, 19, pre 1983. Um, so so um, the Aussie can have this risk aversion, but it will depend then um, from a longer term perspective on how the Australian economy can weather the storm, um, and and that probably won't be known until at least um, towards the end of this year. So. Um, Realistically, it's probably going to be a downward bias um, while the coronavirus remains uh, a bit of a, a problem, um, and then we'll have to see how uh, the economic impact to the not just to the agricultural sector within Australia, but to the broader um, Australian economy, how that kind of plays out as to whether 
you know, 60 cents is the lower whether we start to head down towards the low 50s. My, my suspicion is that 60 cents will be probably closer to the lows and then we might see a range of something between 60 to, you know, 67 cents through this season and into next year. And then if, if you know, if it does look like Corona is becoming um, uh, recoverable from and it's not as, you know, it's not as bad, then, then I wouldn't be surprised to see the Aussie head back towards that kind of higher 60 cents and into the low 70s when we look towards 2021, 2022, um, you know, once we've got through this um, Corona epidemic. I hope that answered that one. I, I was going back to my uh, 12 years as a currency trader there. It wasn't much beef related or sheep related, but anyway, I hope I answered that one. Very well answered. Thank you, Matt. Um, gave a quick insight to those travellers too, wanting to head over next year. Um, now, next question from Lachlan. Uh, if some advertisers were closed as a result of coronavirus employee outbreak, how would this disrupt, uh, disrupt beef dynamics? And what... To what extent would restocker prices be suppressed if feedlot demand is dropped uh, as a reduce as a result of reduced output? Um, yeah, that's. I mean, obviously, we've seen, um, like I said, with with some of that um, buyer type um, average price data, we have seen for this season that um, feed, uh, that um, processors have been very reluctant to to chase this market up. Uh, by the nature of how you know how the, the, the if you compare it to last time around when we saw these highs in the Eki, um they were much processes were much more keen to to kind of follow the market up this time they're not I do suspect that they have got some um, well founded concerns around how um, the season will play out for them and I don't think coronavirus they had these concerns even before coronavirus broke um, you know just just in terms of how low the supply of the herd was um, expected to be. And, you know, that prospect for rain uh, was going to get those restockers reactive just because of that supply issue. Um, we, we do some modelling in Mercado looking at, um, a th it's a theoretical model that takes a look at um, pr processor margins um, in terms of, you know, we're basically reconstructing um, uh, uh, the, 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 it's a beef processor margin, I should clarify. And we're looking at reconstructing the animal and based off, um, a series of kind of um, you know, cow and steer prices, um, and also looking at um, meat prices from around around our, our key export partners and co product prices and high prices. We, we effectively look at um, it's a fairly complex model that, that basically goes to try and find uh, for an average kind of processor what would be the type of margin they're making uh, as an average through the month, um, taking into account obviously um, you know, electricity costs and water and and wage costs and everything else. Uh, and, and we know that the processes have uh, the highest um, operating costs in the world. Um, so that, that's something that uh, means they've got to be very, um, very careful with how they run their operations. Um, this coronavirus is, um, I think, a concern because it's just another overlay that wasn't required in a very in what's going to be a very tight season. Um, the the modeling we do on that um, theoretical processor margin shows that um, with with rain this year and with restock activity, it is going to push um, the average processor margin into a negative for this season. Um, if you contrast it back to um, the not a 16-17 period, um, the the processor margins average, I think it was something like a, a negative $35 on average uh, per head of animal uh, beef animal slaughtered um, for the year uh, across the year. Um, so you know. They weren't making money, and certainly through that period, there was um, extended closure of, of, of plants, and you know they'd, they'd they'd close for a bit longer over the normal kind of closure times, or they'd cut shifts down um, to try and you know just um, save save uh, on those expenses where they could. Um, but obviously, you know they they still need to operate; they can't just let their workforce go t entirely. Um, and so that's what they'll probably look to do this season again, is just where they can. Um, uh, minimise uh, shifts, um, you know, when there are times, say, through, you know, certainly through Easter, close for longer, through uh, winter times when they do a bit of maintenance, they'll close for maybe next week or two uh, and be very careful about what they're spending um, for product. Um, and when with a close eye to what's happening on those um, export markets, because cause they're the ones that have, will bear the brunt of any of any significant um, COVID-led um, crash in export prices, it's going to make um, that margin uh, for them even harder and and um, if again if you go back to that 16 17 period with that average negative margin of minus $35 a head 
There were times in the season, though, through winter, where that margin blew out to, I think, a minus $120 a head. And um, when we looked at what was happening at the sale yard, then looking at processor activity, we did see when those margins were, 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 were getting towards those extreme ends of negatives, um, the processors really pulled back a lot um, in terms of their volumes. Uh, uh, and I, I suspect, you know, we'll see that type of a scenario again this year where they will pull back. Um, I don't think it'll have as big an impact on um, on uh, obviously young cattle prices because um, you know I think given where the where the supply is in the herd mm -hmm. and 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 if we account for that ongoing rain, there's just going to be appetite still to um, to restock. I think um, and and even accounting for um, global concerns, like I said, the modelling that we've got uh, for finished year. Uh, pricing or average pricing still has um, pretty robust pricing uh, to expect for this season and the next season. Um, and I can't see where, where the supply is sitting in that 30 year low in the herd. I can't see um, any reason why we're going to see a huge crash in finished year prices, at least for this year. Um, maybe if Corona continues to extend, it might take a little bit of um, the shine off next year's um, price. Um, but I mean, that's something we've got to have to wait and see how things develop, particularly with Corona and, and that global impact. Great. Thanks, Mac. Ma Matt. Sorry. Uh, for those who are asking, um, these webinars are recorded and they're available on the MLA website and should be uploaded within the week. So if, um, they are all previous webinars of this series are up online on the MLA website. Okay, the next question from Pat. Uh, Matt, do you have any data on input costs over time versus these indicators? It's all well to see the um, EQ rising up and down, but is but presumably input costs for all along the supply chain have risen over time. Uh, we do. Uh, so, so by input costs, I'm assuming there are many things like fertilizer and. Um, and nitrogen and uh, urea and, and other and uh, diesel and other other kind of um, expense costs there. Um, so yeah, we we do we've got a fairly extensive database at Mercado um, across a range of um, different commodities and certainly those that are relevant to not just to the, the beef and sheep meat game but also uh, in the wool space and in the grains and oil seed space. Um, so yeah, we have got a fairly vast database. Um, we do put out. Uh, um, decile, uh, monthly decile um, charts, or not or tables, I should say, on a, on a lot of these, um, not just for, for um, red meat or, or um, livestock prices, but also for some of those other commodities, and also on some of the inputs as well. Um, and, and I know that um, the producers out there do, you know, I mean, decile charts aren't, aren't the, the be all and end all of everything when you're talking about forecasting of uh, pricing. Um, but they're, they're a very good tool to use just to get a feel for where current prices are in, in, in a historic perspective um, in terms of those deciles. Um, with the, the, the rest of the question was based around, um, I think, where those um, input prices have been going. Um, mm -hmm. Certainly, um, up until up until the coronavirus, um, we had been seeing um, nitrogen and fertilizer and, and, and urea pricing coming off. Um, and that was, you know, a, a global supply scenario. That there was, um, there was um, uh, uh, price pressure on those on those commodities um, as we were leading into the end of 2019. However, um, some of the concerns around the supply chain issues um, when coronavirus started to break out of China, we did see a bit of an uptick in in some of those prices, and that was that was based off um, concerns about being able to get product to Australia. Um, you know, with with the disruption to the supply chain, um, and when I say an uptick, it's probably you know they're they're still reasonably low from a historic perspective, but there has been a bit of an uptick across some of those inputs. Um, we we do we do report on that on Mercado, but for the, for those that are Mercado subscribers, um, sometimes we have ones that are just subscribing to the beef uh, or the or the sheep meat analysis. Um, but a lot of the times with those fertilizer input um, discussions, they, they're under our grain section. So if you are a Mercado subscriber and you're only looking at beef and sheep meat and, and maybe wool, it's, it's potentially worthwhile um, to, to just tick the, tick the arrow to, to go and have a look at our grain stuff as well, because that's where we'll, you'll, you'll get the information around, um, around inputs. Um, and certainly, um, for that matter, if, you do, if you're not a subscriber, jump on. Um, you get your first month access to everything for free. 
um, and then there's a lot of back catalogue stuff on there that you can look at um, to um, to pick out not just those decile tables uh, each month, but also um, old articles where we've discussed um, inputs. Great, some really important information to have at your fingertips there. Uh, just a final question. I think you've answered this one um, tonight, Matt, but I think it's a good one to reiterate, to reiterate and finish on. Uh, from Bryce, as a backgrounder, what should we be using to forecast end sale values of our steers into feedlots? Was that end sale values? Yeah. Yeah, okay, so um, that's a great question. Um, some of those models I showed you tonight in terms of that Eastern State Trail Lab Indicator, the ECI and the Nas uh, National Heavy Steer one are ones we've developed over time. Um, as it stands now, um, we haven't yet developed a feeder steer um, pricing model. It's probably something that um, we could look to do, but it, some of these this modelling, um, I know it looks fairly simple on the chart, but it does take quite a lot of data and quite a lot of time to um, to make sure there's some robustness around the model um, from a statistical economic perspective. Um, so I'd love to be able to say, oh, I could just point you to the uh, feeder steer uh, price we've got, um, but we don't have one just yet. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I, I guess, um, uh, what what you probably could do is use that national heavy steer price um, and you'd probably need to get an, a gauge as to what the normal kind of um, basis is between feeder steers and heavy steers and then you could potentially you know if you, if you had a um, I mean we could do it here at Mercado we could look through the data and say you know this is the general basis you see and, and, and how the basis might move through time depending upon the season or depending upon what happens with the grain price say because um, that would affect the basis of course um, for the feeder price um, yeah, we could manipulate the data and have a look at it and, and produce something where we could say, well, you know, you can use your national heavy steer and then apply a basis of plus or minus this according to the season. Um, I don't have those numbers at hand um, right now, of course, um, but it's, you know, it's something that um, one of the other things that can happen on Mercado if you're a subscriber is you can um, send us through an email and say, can you look at X, Y, Z? And that's some, one, something that, you know, some of, our best, um, some of our best pieces we put out on Mercado come from our subscribers giving us some ideas and, and that's certainly a fantastic idea from Bryce to um, one to start to develop a feeder steer model <laughs> and the other thing uh, failing that would be to um, maybe put out an article looking at the uh, the basis between feeder steers and national heavy steer perhaps and then that'd, that'd be able to allow then the, the, the readers to um, to use the national heavy steer forecast and, and apply the basis to get an idea of a of a, of a feeder steer basis. Um, so keep an eye out. We might do that in the next week or so. Great. That sounds great. Thanks, Matt. All right, that's all for the questions tonight. Um, thank you very much for fielding them, Matt. There were some good ones come through. Uh, so don't forget next week, Thursday night, Ben Lee from the McKinnon Project uh, on feeding uh, wiener cattle. Uh, thanks again for joining us, Matt, um, and good night, everyone. No worries. Thanks a lot.